Well, it's time for another lecture. Today's topic will be Versailles, Russia, and Italy in the years following the First World War. This lecture will contain about three areas of focus. First of all, we'll explore the Paris Peace Conference and the provisions of the Versailles Treaty. Then we'll look at events in Russia. We'll define some terms and look at some historical trends, and then the Communist Revolution and Vladimir Lenin. Following Lenin's death, we see the rise of Joseph Stalin. And then we'll explore the rise of Benito Mussolini. The first area of focus will be the Paris Peace Conference, which resulted in the Versailles Treaty. The Paris Peace Conference was a meeting of the leaders of the Allied powers in the years immediately following the First World War. A photo of those leaders is shown here. Two of those leaders are shown here. On the upper right we see Georges Clemenceau. He was the premier from France. On the bottom right we see David Lloyd George. He was the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Each had their own goal when it came to the Paris Peace Conference. They wanted to punish Germany for causing the First World War. Now I know I've already shown this, but I just wanted to reinforce some of the attitudes that some of these powers had as we see the devastation caused by the First World War. Someone had to pay. Remember this slide from a while back? Ever since the end of the Franco-Prussian War, the French wanted vengeance. Once again, here we see a portrait of Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States. He came to the Paris Peace Conference with a different set of ideas. His goal was to develop a peace agreement without victors, and he wanted to create a new international organization called the League of Nations to prevent wars in the future. While these were Wilson's ideals, most in Europe agreed with the ideas of Clemenceau and Lloyd George, and they wanted to punish Germany for World War I. The final provisions of the Versailles Treaty demonstrate the vengeance that the Allied powers wanted against Germany. First of all, Germany had to admit that they were solely responsible for causing the war. This was seen in the notorious Article 231 War Guilt Clause, where they had to admit that they had caused the war. Secondly, because Germany had caused it, they would have to pay for the cost of the war. Europe was devastated as a result of the First World War. Someone was going to have to pay for the cost of it, so Germany was forced to pay reparations. An exact amount was unclear. However, initially, the Germans were going to be required to pay $5 billion a year until 1921. In order to prevent Germany from causing another war, their army was reduced dramatically. Their military could only have about 100,000 troops. They were prohibited from having planes, tanks, and submarines. Also, the German Rhineland had to be a demilitarized zone. The dark blue area of this map identifies the Rhineland. It remained Germany's territory, however, they didn't want to have any troops in it as it included the border along France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Germany was also forced to give up territory. The region of Alsace-Lorraine was returned to France. Poland received Danzig. The arrow here points to Alsace and Lorraine. This was a region on the border between France and Germany. At one point it had been part of France, then it was part of Germany, and it was returned to the French as a result of the Versailles Treaty. The second arrow is pointing to Danzig, which was granted to Poland. Taken together, the provisions of the Versailles Treaty punished Germany tremendously. Some argue it was so punitive that even though this was the peace treaty that ended the First World War, it was the cause of the Second. We'll come back to this later. We will now switch gears a little bit and look at events in Russia. Now I know this is a little bit of repeat, but I wanted to revisit the definition of some terms. The first is socialism. 
A quick textbook definition is public or governmental ownership of all businesses. Communism is a type of socialism. First, after a nation industrializes, the workers get together, they realize they have a common effort, and they stage a bloody and violent revolution. Next, a police state is then established where all opposition is crushed. They needed to do so in order to make sure that the revolution was a success. Finally, a workers' dictatorship would then be established so that everyone could live as equals. The ideas included in communism were found in the Communist Manifesto, co-written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, first published in 1848. Now that we've explored some terms covered in the past, I'd like to look at some background history and the Russian Revolution and Civil War. In many ways, the Russia of 1900 was characterized by a tremendous backwardness. Some of the earlier events that we've discussed in the class never took place there. For example, remember the Enlightenment, the new way of looking at the world and the universe? Well, there was no Enlightenment. There was very little industrialization of Russia, even by 1900. Maybe three quarters or 80% of the population was made up of peasants, even as late as 1900. And of those individuals, probably 90% lived at or below the poverty level. The First World War led to a great deal of upheaval in Russia. On the left, we see some scenes of mob violence during the war. It was terribly unpopular in Russia, as there was a lack of food and people began to protest the situation that they were facing. Their lives were characterized by chaos, frustration, and anger. People targeted their anger at the monarchy in Russia. The Tsar, or the King of Russia, during the First World War was Nicholas II. He was a weak and tentative ruler. Because it was clear that he couldn't control things, he abdicated or he willingly gave up his throne in 1917. However, he and then members of his family were placed under arrest and then later executed. The image of the right shows Anastasia. She was Nicholas's daughter. She may or may not have been killed when the rest of her family was murdered. On the left, we see an image of the movie version of Anastasia. Most historians do believe that she was a victim of this execution. During the war, a new leader emerged in Russia. His name was Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. He had been born in Russia, but had been kicked out of the country because he had rebelled against the government. He returned to his home country during the chaos of the First World War to lead a revolution. He promised peace, land, and bread. Lenin was a charismatic speaker, and on the left we see him talking to people in rural areas, where this idea of peace and redistribution of land was very popular. On the right, we see Lenin addressing a huge crowd in the city of Moscow. Again, his message resonated with many different people. Lenin was a communist. However, according to Marx's ideas, the revolution to transform society had to take place after a country went through the Industrial Revolution. Well, Lenin had a different philosophy. He argued that workers and peasants could come together to stage a revolution to destroy the government in place. All they needed was a peace treaty to end Russia's involvement in the First World War. Russia ended up signing a separate peace agreement with the Germans and left the war early. They did so when they agreed to the provisions of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. There are two provisions to this treaty. First of all, Russia surrendered to the Germans and left the war. Secondly, this came at a heavy cost. Russia lost about a quarter of its territory to Germany. The arrows here point to the green sections of the map. This was territory that Russia handed over to the Germans as they signed their separate peace in 1918. Although Russia left the First World War in early 1918, chaos continued in their country and a civil war raged for three years. 
Lenin and his supporters were called Bolsheviks. After three years of bloody warfare, the Bolsheviks were victorious. Vladimir Lenin is shown here. He has began to establish a range of reforms and change the name of Russia to the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. However, just three years after the Civil War, he suffered a stroke and he died. Although Lenin died in 1924, just like the ancient pharaohs, his body was preserved for many years. Here we see an image of Red Square and the exterior of Lenin's tomb. I was able to visit Lenin's body and his tomb several years ago. He looked pretty good for a guy who had been dead about 100 years. Just as people visit religious shrines today, the communist leaders wanted to use religion to be an opiate of the masses, and rather than worshiping Christianity, they tried to replace these Christian symbols with communist symbols, which is why they preserved Lenin's body for so many years. Following Lenin's death, someone else began to emerge as the leader of Russia. We'll talk about Joseph Stalin next. Joseph Stalin came from a rural area of the Soviet Union. His mother always wanted him to be a minister, but that didn't take place. Eventually, he became a communist and served as secretary of the Communist Party. In that capacity, he appointed many people to offices in different regions or districts. This meant that those people owed their position and their power to him. So he was able to use those personal relationships to consolidate power by the 1920s. By 1928, Stalin had consolidated power and implemented the five-year plan. His goal was to modernize his country as quickly as possible. The first focus was on industrial production. By 1940, the production had increased by 400% and saw the construction of 1,500 new factories. Power plants were built, and there was an increased emphasis on steel production. Also, agriculture had a focus. He wanted to collectivize and modernize the farmland, particularly in the Ukraine. Some 80% of the population lived as peasants on the land. Well, they were very inefficient. So, Stalin forced people to move from traditional family plots and replaced these small family farms with large government-run operations with modern equipment. Here we see some posters focusing on the brotherhood of workers and the promotion of industrialization as they began to try to uh, get people to be excited about increased productivity throughout the country. Stalin's five-year plan was an amazing success, really successful. However, it came at a tremendous cost. There were many poor and unsafe working conditions that the workers faced. They also did not have any increase in their living conditions. Also, as a lot of people were opposed to the collectivization of agriculture, particularly in the Ukraine, hundreds and thousands of people were imprisoned. Many even died in a famous famine between, in the early 1930s. The arrow here points to the Ukraine. This is where a lot of that devastation took place, where the famines were, uh, and where a lot of that agriculture was collectivized. Stalin was also infamous for his purges. Any and all opponents seemed to be crushed. People who were opposed to the collectivization, well, they either found themselves being sent to Siberia, in prisons, or many were flat out killed. Also, religion came under attack. Now, I know I've already shown this, but Lenin had once said that religion was the opiate of the masses. As far as Stalin was concerned, what he wanted to do was he wanted to replace religion as the thing or the drug that made people happy and replace it with communism. The treatment of the Cathedral of Christ the Savior can be a good example as to how Stalin attacked religion. This had originally been built as a major cathedral to symbolize the victory over Napoleon in the 1800s. An image of it is shown here on the left. Remember this slide from quite a while back? 
In 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia with his grand army, yet Napoleon was defeated. Well, that cathedral shown on the left was built in honor of this victory over Napoleon. Stalin had that wonderful cathedral torn to the ground. It was destroyed in 1931. The plan was to replace it with a new cathedral. Rather than with Christian heroes, this was going to be kind of a hall of fame for communist heroes. It never ended up happening. However, this we see with the history of the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, the destruction of religious imagery and an attempt to replace it with communist symbols. Now, just to show that this story comes full circle, yes, the cathedral was destroyed in 1931. However, after the fall of communism in the year 2000, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior was rebuilt once again. Let me tell you, it was a wonderful story and a wonderful place of worship. Stalin's purges also continued in other areas. Political opponents often were arrested. Sometimes they were imprisoned without the opportunity to have a trial. In other cases, they were executed. Maybe hundreds of thousands of victims. In the late 1930s, several army officers were targeted as they seemed to pose a threat to Stalin. And possibly the most famous victim of the purges is shown here. This is Leon Trotsky, who was involved in the Russian Civil War and was a supporter of Lenin. Stalin had him killed in 1940. The last topic for today would be the emergence of Benito Mussolini in Italy. The image here shows Benito Mussolini. At one time, he was a school teacher. Then he went to school and he became a journalist. And then he became an advocate to try to reform society. He was able to come to power and was able to gain popularity in the chaos in Italy following the First World War. I know I've shown this already, <laughs> however, but I wanted to focus on the casualty rate among the Italians. Notice here. 1.6% of the population either died or was wounded as a result of the First World War. That's an incredibly high percentage. Mussolini was able to come to power in Italy in 1922 as a result of a military coup. He served as his country's leader until the Second World War in 1943. Mussolini is often referred to as a fascist leader. There are kind of three themes I want to address with this. First of all, they wanted to control everything within the state. All aspects of the economy and social life were geared toward the support of the nation. Secondly, there could be nothing against the state. No one could question the government. There was no toleration of political dissent. Third, there was nothing outside the state. This implied that Italy's borders would be expanded over time and they would grow to have more control over different parts of Europe. I was able to find this information and this definition on the website below. Mussolini was a master at propaganda and here we see his headquarters in the city of Rome. There's an image of his face and the word see is everywhere, which is Italian for yes, meaning Mussolini could do no wrong. He could only do things that were right. As the fascist leader of Italy, Mussolini implemented a series of reforms. First of all, he sponsored a broad system of public works projects. These included the construction of rail lines as well as superhighways to provide people with jobs. Also, um, the traditional role of women was put on a pedestal and women were encouraged to stay home and have large families. In fact, limits were placed on companies. Companies could only have 10% of its employees be female. This opened up more jobs for men, yet it lowered opportunities for women. Also, all opposition was crushed by a secret police called OVRA. This image shows members of Mussolini's personal military squad, who often intimidated and terrorized people into support for his policies.
Ever since he became a national figure, Mussolini talked about the importance of the Catholic Church. He supported a close relationship between the government and the Church, which finally culminated in an agreement called the Lateran Pact. This made Catholicism the state religion and allowed the Catholic Church to have control over a lot of the public education in the country. Do some of these reforms implemented by Mussolini sound like some of the actions of Napoleon? Both strove to have control over many aspects of people's lives. Each had their own secret police force that limited freedom of speech, freedom of press, and just lack of toleration of dissent. Also, each used the church or religion to bolster their popularity. Well, we're just about at the end. I'd like to review some of the main ideas included in the presentation. A range of topics were addressed today. First of all, we focused on the Versailles Treaty and the fact that it punished Germany tremendously. Secondly, we saw events in Russia, the Civil War and the rise of Vladimir Lenin and emergence of Joseph Stalin. Next, we see the rise of Mussolini out of the chaos following the First World War in Italy. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to write an essay that compares and contrasts the actions and accomplishments of Lenin, Stalin, and Mussolini. Well, that's it for today. Take care, have a good day, and we'll talk to you soon.